Do you guys ever think that ants would be more advanced if they had opposable thumbs? Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast. My name is Joey Schultz and I am joined as always by my fantastic co-hosts. First up, the guy whose friendship is sort of like opening up a foil fetch land. It's Matt Morgan. So Joey, I did find a magical lamp the other day. Genie popped out. It was awesome. He gave me three wishes and my first wish I said, I wish I were rich. And so the genie looked at me and said, all right, what do you want for your second wish, Mr. Rich? Oh, the genie dad joked you back. <sighs> he got me. He got Ouch. me. That stings, Matt. I love it. Next, the guy whose friendship feels like cracking cracking open a uh, an eighth copy of, say, like a bulk rare. And that's just Dana Roach. Oh, Joey. Just for that, I want to make us have this show be about hybrid mana in Commander and making a change. Because that wouldn't at all be <laughs> controversial or annoying to anyone to hear about again for the 150th Not... time in the last 10 days. Not at all all not at all data anyway this is the edh Recast. edh rec is a fantastic deck building website that collects data from deck lists all over the internet to provide helpful recommendations for new commander decks and here on the podcast we'd like to give all that data a little more context ladies gents and beyond please welcome to the show our friends from up in the north hiding out in the frontier bivouacs of canada the stellar chefs of the commander cookout podcast it's brian and rando i mean sorry ryan and brando they got us. <laughs> that's that's Brian and Rando from DDO. <laughs> <laughs> we hate those guys. Yeah. How yeah. is it going, fellas? Good. What is going down? Uh, lots of good stuff because you guys are here. Folks may remember uh, Ryan was on our Theros crossover set review episode when Theros Beyond Death was released, and it was a whole bunch of fun to have him on the show. But also, folks might know you from your own show on CCO, where you guys talk about a bunch of really awesome stuff. Tell folks all about you and your content. Yeah, well, we are Ryan and Brando at CCO Podcast, at CCO Brando on Twitter. And we do Commander Cookout podcast and the Commander Cookout YouTube channel where we talk about interesting, spicy, funny Commander decks or I'll say arcs of topics where we try and cover a specific topic over the course of four or five episodes to get a bunch of coverage on it to, to really delve into what makes for unique gameplay experiences. Yeah, and you guys actually recently closed up your, I think it was called the Arc of the Other, where you went over a bunch of decks from members of the Commander community, um, including myself on that, and then a couple of other uh, really, really famous folks too. And that was a really a whole bunch of fun. Yeah, we spent uh, six weeks proving that we're the best deck builders on the internet. By stealing other people's <laughs> decks. That's right. <laughs> That's how we do it. But it was, it was a lot of fun. It was great to see some of the other stuff that you, you kind of get when you leave like first your friend group, your own brain, your local meta, and play with decks from around the world. It's good to see what other content creators and magic players in general are, are doing out there. Yeah, literally sort of around the world. We had DJ from Jumble Commander. We had Josh LaCroix from the command <laughs> area. The Commander Lighthouse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a Joseph M. Schultz from some uh, show i've never heard of him. some yeah. never yeah who, who's that guy josh lacroy that kills me every time you guys say that on your show <laughs> <laughs> probably kills him too <laughs> i'll bet yeah that's really wonderful uh but that's not actually the only things that you guys do there's also the commander ad populum show that ryan hosts and also uh ryan you have a really cool day job that is associated with magic as well I do. You know what? We both have we both have really cool day jobs. Mine is I'll get to Brando's in a second because I think that I can describe it sort of well. My day job, though, is magic card alterations. I spend the majority of my week doing custom commissions for people who want painted magic cards. And the the uh, the rest of my week is filled with the commander cookout auction pieces that we auction off on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash CCO podcast. You can go there every Thursday afternoon for altered magic cards. And Brando's day job is actually how we started Commander Cookout. And one night we were sitting around a table. I was convinced, I'll say that, that Brando is this awesome technical producer for the biggest radio show in the province that we live in. I am. He is. Award-winning, that is. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, we 
always talk about magic. Why don't we just start recording it? So it was actually Brando's job that got us started in the, the podcasting industry. Yeah. Very nice. That's really cool. You said you were award winning. That's pretty great. What type of awards? Uh, we won a couple of national news awards uh, for the coverage of an actual like a bus tragedy that happened. A bunch of a hockey team oh. was in a, a T-bone accident with a semi. And it wasn't a good scene, but we won a, an award for being the, the station that covered it the best for the longest. Um, and there was a couple of other breaking news things. There was a Blizzard one we won an award for as well. Uh, and I was just, I'm part of the team, so technically I am award winning. And I will tell you all about that later. <laughs> I, I guess, sorry, no shade intended, but you covered the news of a blizzard in Canada. Is that, is that count as news? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, before we move on to our oh. main show, I do want to remind listeners about our episode 100 giveaway, which is going to be the very next episode. This is episode 99. Episode 100 is coming up in exactly one week. So folks, definitely make sure that you enter to win this awesome giveaway. All you have to do is follow and subscribe and or leave us a review. So you get one entry into the giveaway each for following us on Facebook, on Twitter, and for subscribing on YouTube. So that's three entries just for clicking the follow or subscribe button. And you can also get two entries for leaving us a podcast review you on your podcatcher of choice such as itunes so we have a chance of getting five entries to the giveaway and for this giveaway we will be picking three winners winners can get in touch with us to let us know two things first whether they would like an Trek shirt or an Trek cast playmat and second which new commander they will be building because we will be putting together a package including some of the high synergy and top cards for that commander according to that commander's Trek page to help get your deck jump started so definitely make sure to give us a follow subscribe on youtube and leave us a review to be entered to win that awesome giveaway because we are announcing the winners on our very next episode when we hit episode 100. Hey, hey Joey, but, is there yeah. anything else interesting or special about episode 100? There is, but we'll have to leave people in suspense. Okay, about all right, that. all right. Oh. <laughs> it, it is an episode 100 after all, so it's got to be fun, right? Okay. Uh, but before we move on to our main topic, we also have one other question that we'd love to ask our guests, and that is simply what their favorite commander decks are. Maybe their signature deck or the one that they're having the most fun playing right now. So Ryan and Brando, please, so that we can all get to know you a little bit better, tell us about your favorite commander decks. Uh, well, uh, mine, my signature one, I talk about it all the time. I take it everywhere I go is my Noran the Wary deck. Uh, it started off as a chaos coin flip, had literally no way to close out a game other than making people rage quit. Uh, ah. Ryan... <laughs> Hated it so much. His face tells the story. Um, so I've recently, it, over the years, have been foiling it out and kind of tuning <laughs> it to make it into an actual deck that can can win games. Uh, and now it's more of a soft red stacks chaos kind of control deck. So much it, better. It still has some <laughs> chaos stuff in it, but it I can win games with it, and it can swing with the the big decks, and it can also be in the in the kitty pool with the the little fish too. I really like that. I also have a Sliver Queen deck that I like to carry around with me just in case I get the chance to play it. But nobody likes Slivers, so I tend to keep that one on the back burner a little bit. I think I think I have to tip my hat to my Animar deck. That is my first kind of deck that I love and my first deck that morphed into a CEDH deck. And we don't do the CEDHs in, in CCO Nation, but if anybody does want to throw down, I do have a deck, and that is Animar. And... I play it so seldomly now that my friends and the dude bros in the nation have have sort of just coined it the stack of 100 business cards because every single card in the deck has had some form of alteration done to it. Some alternate art, extended art, cartoon art, something added to it. And I do love to show it off. So if anybody ever sees us at, a, at an MF or some event somewhere or wants to see it on Twitter, just let me know and I'll post some pictures because I love showing it off. Yeah, and it's really cool work. I actually have a uh, an altar that Ryan did uh, for my Moldervine Reclamation, which Dana uh, very, very nicely commissioned. Uh, he paid for me to get that, which is really cool. So now I've got a thing that some friends of mine worked on in my Marin deck. So it makes me doubly happy whenever I see that card because it's also just a really good card in Marin. So I, I, really actually, I actually just packaged up an Underground Sea and sent it to Ryan to get altered. Ooh, so all I'm, or Dana. I strapped that envelope to the back of a moose, and it should be up there in <laughs> six to eight weeks, I think, based on trajectory. It was heading the right direction, so we should be good to go. I believe they call it a fortnight up there. Yeah. 
Wow, that is awesome. So let's move on now to our main topic for the episode. Matt, what is it that we are talking about today? So we're going to talk about high and low variance commanders. That indeed, or as the guys from CCO like to call it, spicy and milky commanders. So on CCO, after you guys are done with a deck tech on any given episode, you give that list a spice rating or a milk rating. What is this? What madness is going on here? How does this all work? Walk us through it. Okay, so when we first started Commander Cookout, we knew we needed a way to essentially prove to the audience, right? Yeah. That we were taking decks and building unique versions of that commander, right? So one of the things we do is called Project Atraxa. There are Atraxa lists that focus on infect counters or plus one plus ones or or charge counters or what what have you. Infect, super friends. Super yeah. friends, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we just we developed this spice calculator to make sure that we weren't doing that. And it takes into account how many builds there are on edhrec.com. How many of the cards in our particular deck match the the main page for a particular commander? And then a couple other things like how many tutors, how quickly does it win, how close is the average converted mana cost of the deck to like one or how low the average CMC is? Because generally the lower the CMC, the more streamlined the deck is. And boring, as Brando says. There's, there's only so many good one-drop removal spells only so many good two drop mana rocks so as you inch closer to including all of the best in slot things your deck gets less spicy gotcha okay so it sounds like a weird way to try and figure out a way to make the decks unique basically yeah a lot less programming involved than on your guys's end but, but i think we still we still get there <laughs> anytime you can use math to prove that your deck isn't the same as everybody else's deck it's great and you you cannot argue with science <laughs> <laughs> wow so so i have a question for you guys then What's the spiciest little habanero you guys have ever ever had a chance to review? This the, the hottest pepper. The hottest pepper. The hottest. I think the one that got the highest. I think it was in the low to mid eighties. I think was the time we did Damia Sage of Stone Relentless Rats. Or was it Rat Colony? One of the two. It was a rats it, deck, and <laughs> there was when you go to Damia's page, there's no other rats, right? So automatically we're getting lots of points because we've got like 30 rats, for example. Yeah. But then we played things like Sphinx of the Chimes. Yeah. Right? You discard two cards if they share the same name, like two non-lands that share the same name, you get to draw four cards. Hell yeah. And then a whole bunch of weird stuff that just worked when you have multiple copies of the same card. And because it was a Damia list, most people were playing like Salty Good stuff, but no, we're playing rats. And it was it was a really fun deck, one of my favorite episodes. It's very good. And then the, I think we had the 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 least spicy nugget was the uh, Mizix, where we just went on to EDH rec at that cam, and we just used the EDH page to build the list. And it was every Mizix deck you've ever played against, and every Mizix deck you ever hated playing against. <laughs> so that's the most lactose intolerant deck you've ever actually ran up against. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> in real life and on the show. So, so what inspired you guys to come up with this, the, the spice list and the milk list? Basically, it was just the need to demonstrate to people that we were doing something that wasn't like the general good stuff cards that pop up when you look at Atraxa or when you look at Damia Sage of Stone or just the, the general chaos theme that was inherent with every Noran deck on EDH Rec. We wanted to do something different. Gotcha. And that sounds like a very uh, Dana way of doing things, actually, because Dana is also very about that doing something unique with his commanders, too. Dana's a hipster. Yep. We're, 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 we're like the cool guys. Dana's the hipster guy. Yeah. Dana's got the hipster beard and everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Well, since you guys have this whole spicy and low variance and high variance, etc., you're doing that on your show. We wanted to invite you onto our show to also take a look at some of that data. We actually took a measurement of the commanders across the entire website whose decks most consistently contain the same cards. So as a quick sort of acknowledgement of how this data was drawn. Some commanders actually use a lot of the top or high synergy cards, but have a lot of differences in the rest of the 99. While some other commanders may actually use a lot of common cards in the 99, but veer away from the high synergy or top cards. 
So what uh, our programmer did, EDHRX programmer Nate Burgess, helped us out by measuring the percentage of commonality among the top and high synergy cards and measurements that expanded into the 99 and provided us with the results. Um, in other words, the math is hard to explain uh, and even harder to listen to, really. <laughs> like there are logarithms involved and I don't think anyone wants to hear us join on about that. So we won't get into the obvious, the big numbers there, um, but we do have some results which we wanted to share with you guys here. So what we will start off with is actually the milky commanders that uh, have a lot of low variance among those. If you encounter one of these decks in the wild, it is likely to contain many of the same cards as another deck with the same commander that you might also encounter out there in the wild. As a quick note, this data was drawn in early January. It took kind of a while to process. Um, and a few things have possibly shifted around here and there in the intervening time. So that is a thing to keep in mind. Um, and also as a note, we made the executive decision to remove from the list any commanders who showed fewer than 100 decks on EDHREC. Technically speaking, yes, Zuberi Golden Feather was the number two commander on this list, but it's not exactly interesting for us to talk about how Zuberi Golden Feather's 28 total decks tend to contain a lot of the same cards and have a lot in common with each other because it's just such a small sample size. So we only wanted to talk about commanders who have at least 100 decks so that we can get some interesting stuff here. Uh, specifically, we are going to order this list by the top 10 card ubiquity. So we are looking at the top 10 cards in a deck and seeing what percentage of those cards show up uh, among all of the uh, decks that we have on the website. So we're looking specifically on that and that's how we're ordering this. But like we mentioned above, uh, these were averaged acro across more than just this one particular metric. But when we were talking with Nate about how to actually describe this succinctly and in an entertaining way, conveying the math to people without bogging things down, this is probably gonna be the easiest way to go rather than us talking about all those logarithms. So with that all out of the way, let's actually just get to that top 10 list. Matt, do you mind starting us off? Which is our number one most milky, lowest variance commander? So the milkiest of milk commanders is gonna be Kadena Slinking Sorcerer. That is the Sultai Morph commander that came in one of the commander precons recently. Uh, where everything everything that you cast for the first time that is a face-down creature costs three less, and then whenever you cast a morph creature, you draw a card. Pretty basic, pretty boring. 782 decks total going into Kadena. 96% cards are going to be the same. That's how ubiquitous, that's how much overlap happens in a Kadena deck. You said pretty boring. I know a couple of Kadena players who would uh, put you on a bit of a roast there for saying uh, it's... Uh... But, I can but live with that. But they're boring players, Joey, so like, it's fine. <laughs> Savage, you guys. I totally disagree. Kadena is very, very interesting. But we are seeing a lot of uh, ubiquity among um, the Kadena decks because there are, after all, only so many more. So it makes sense that they would have a lot in common with each other. Like, like Brando said, you cannot argue with science. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> What's the number two? Number two is Thelon of Havenwood, commander out of Time Spiral. Um, Two-color deck. Only 108 of these, but that's enough to get us 94% ubiquity. And Thelon is a elf druid that basically interacts with funguses. So each fungus you control gets plus one, plus one for each spore counter on it. And you can spend mana to remove a fungus card uh, in a graveyard from the game to put a spore counter on each fungus in play. So it's essentially a fungus tribal deck. Very, very bizarre. I do like Golgari, but this one's pretty weird. Number three on the list, we have Ayula, Queen Among Bears. This is the two mana 2-2 two, two from Modern Horizons, legendary bear. Whenever you play bears, you can either put counters on it or it can have your bears fight other bears. Uh, this one, we had 536 total decks for this commander, and the top 10 cards were showing up in 91% of the Ayula decks that we had. So we've got a 91% ubiquity rating on that one. So that comes in as our number three. No, so number four, we have Depala Pilot Eg Exemplar, which is the Boros Commander. It's the kind of dwarf and vehicle lord type of effect. And when you tap it, you can search for some cards. Uh, it's kind of the 2% milk. It's, it's fairly milky, <laughs> little, little less so than a few of the others. But there are 489 decks out there for Depala. 90% of those cards will overlap between all of those decks. And next up, we have Azuri Renegade Leader, who is the first one of these to fall below 90% at 89% ubiquity. Um, Azuri is a mono green elf's matter commander who can regenerate an elf or overrun elf creatures. And it's an activated ability you can use multiple times. So very much encouraging you to play elves and go wide with as many elves as possible. 
Up next, we had Ulrich of the Kralen Horde at number six and also at that 89% ubiquity level. This one had 300 decks. Remember that Ulrich is the... um. The really good werewolf commander, right, guys? <laughs> uh, everyone loves it. Five mana, four, four, that gives plus four or can fight stuff if it flips over. It's uh, the werewolf we all wanted. Anyway, it shows up at uh, 89% uh, ubiquity rating for Ulrich right there. So it's at our number six. So number seven and eight, both are Kozilex. Uh, the number seven is Kozilek the Great Distortion, where you draw a bunch of cards when it comes into play, and you can discard cards to counter stuff with the same CMC. And then you also have Kozilek Butcher of Truth coming in at number eight, which is the one that just draws you four cards, but also is the one that has Annihilator and does some big, dirty things. Uh, those both are coming in. Kozilek the Great Distortion, 863 decks with 89% homogeneity. And then number eight with Butcher of Truth, only 136 decks, but also 89% of the cards overlap with each other between all those decks. At number nine, we have Seton Croson Protector, an old commander from, I think, Odyssey Block. Um, it's a Druid Legend, and you can tap an untapped Druid you control to add a green to your mana pool. So it's a, a commander that cares about Druids, which is probably a pretty thin pool of cards to choose from, and that's why it's only at 88% ubiquity. Indeed. And speaking of 88%, our number 10 also comes in at 88% ubiquity. This one has 206 decks at the time that we pulled this particular report. It is Wart Boggart Auntie, the Rakdos Goblin Shaman that can pull goblin cards out of your graveyard back to your hand. So those are the top 10. The Kadena, the Thelans, the Aeulas, Depalas, Azuris, Ulrichs, Kozileks, Setons, and Warts of the world. So now I kind of want to pass it off to you guys over at CCO. What do you make of the top 10 list? What trends do you see among these low variance, milky commanders? Well, I think that one thing that especially these cards and probably a lot of cards that you're going to see that have the, the low variance things with them is because the, the card basically tells you what to do with it. And the only way you're going to not end up with a, the same deck as everybody else is if you don't do that. And if you're not going to not do what the card tells you to do, why are you building that one? Like You don't build a Boros attacky everybody matters thing and then put a dwarf vehicle commander at the helm of it. You wouldn't play not morph creatures in the morph lady. I mean... You wouldn't play not funguses in Thelen of Havenwood, or you could just play Thelen of Havenwood and have those two good funguses be really good. But you're not going to do that either because Thelen of There's Havenwood only two? sucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Are you speaking from personal experience? I am. I had that deck just... together before Biorhythm was banned, and the only way that deck could possibly win was Wrath the Board with Damnation and play Biorhythm. Didn't work one time. <laughs> my life you guys oh God. feels like you've got some feelings to excise there man <laughs> but you you make an excellent observation definitely we are seeing a lot of tribal among this list i mean there are only so many bears there are only so many druids uh seven of the commanders that we listed here involve niche tribes in some way um and also niche abilities like there are only so many vehicles there are only so many morphs stuff like that um and then i also think colorless probably has a lot to do with it too like it makes a lot of sense that the kozileks would appear on this list because they have such a limited card pool to pull to pull from in the first place so of course there's going to be a lot of homogeneity among their list the decks will largely look the same just because they have so few spells to actually play when you look at some of them too you're seeing legendary creatures that were printed relatively recently with the exception of felon of havenwood and like Seton or whatever, but you're looking at cards that were printed recently or printed in a commander precon and maybe newer players who might not have access to as deep of a card pool to go outside of the morphs that were included in the morph precon, for example, they might not have all of the other cards that they require. Like the three other good ones. That's kind of like the precon effect you guys call it, right? Sort of. Sort of, something like that. I was kind of interested, though, since I had uh, mentioned the colors above, we actually do see uh, a bit of color restriction on this particular list. For example, we have four two-color decks from among that top ten and one three-color deck, um, and then, of course, the colorless ones. And I also wanted to see, uh, looking past some of these top ten commanders, to see if this was a uh, a thing that maintained, a pattern that maintained itself. Um, and I came across a couple of other commanders that do have a few more colors, such as Angie Falconrath, um, 
madness lady there, Gishath, dinosaur tribal, Arcades, the strategist, the wall defender bont guy. So again, we're seeing some of those uh, niche strategies such as defenders or tribes involved there. But then I also came across the Ur Dragon and Sliver Overlord as popular commanders that actually have very low variants among them. So we did manage to find some five color commanders, but they are again niche tribes. Yeah, I think the color thing does really matter a lot. You know, if you're talking about like a mono white deck, you're probably running Swords of Plowshares and Path to Exile as your removal spells for creatures. After that, things get a little bit lean and I'm not sure what you're going to pick. Um, whereas if you're, you know, playing black white, all of a sudden you're competing with all of black's removal spells and all of the black white removal spells. And if you then add in, you know, blue to that, you've got now Pontify in the mix and Rapid Hydrization in the mix. So the more colors you add, the more really good cards there are that you need to consider for that deck slot as well. And I think that's definitely a factor about why a lot of these are one or two colors. Yeah. And one thing that I do need to kind of eat a little bit of crow on about this list is when we first saw this list a long time ago, when we, we first started doing the podcast, Gitrog Monster was the number one commander on this. It was easily one of the top ones for, for a long, long time. We kind of recircled back to this list. Gitrog Monster, as it turns out, is down to, I believe, number 203. Is that correct, Joey? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Gitrog Monster players, they finally figured out how to kind of get hip, get all Dana with it do what they weren't doing before. So good on them. I will, you know, I take back and I apologize for all of my course words, but now I'm just going to make fun of Kadena players because they have taken over that top spot. Well, and that's that's so funny. Back when Gitrog came out, and also back at the time when we originally pulled a report like this ages ago, like it actually does make sense because the number of landfall cards were a lot more limited. There were only so many that you could use, and that also was a very prescriptive, quote unquote, strategy. You had some very dedicated landfall cards. But as time has gone on, we've received more and more and more amazing landfall types of synergies. So it actually makes sense that Gitrog would have moved way, way down because there are now several different ways that you can take that deck. You can go full on combo with Gitrog if you want, but you can also play a bit more of the, uh, you know, just value inclined stuff as we've seen with other updates, like things that we got from the Lord Windgrace precon, for example. So it does make sense that that strategy is a lot more open-ended than it used to be compared to some of the other strategies we have now, like morphs and defenders, which are still very limited in how many of them we even have to put into a deck in the first place, let alone how many good ones we have. I do want to point out too, Joey, that one of your favorite commanders is at number 50. So Titania actually is quite a bit yeah. higher. So you can take all of that ire that I used to give towards Get Rock players. <laughs> Oh, oh, man. But that actually uh, leads into a good point. We should put ourselves to task here a little bit, see if we have any of these uh, low variance commanders that sort of build themselves, the decks tell you what to do. Um, because Ryan, an interesting data point here, as I understand it, you really like the commander Zada Hedron Grinder, which you know, sort of expounds the spells that you cast that target one of your creatures to all of your creatures. Um, Zada Hedron Grinder shows up at That's number it. 12 That's on this it. list. So you've got a, a very milky commander indeed, very, very low variance. What do you have Talk to say? Talk about eating crow, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a CCOism. Two things. First thing, I think Zada, sort of like the Gitrog monster, has evolved over time with the with the adoption of CEDH into the greater commander community. Zada has transformed a little bit. If you looked at Zada from a couple years ago, you would see Zada Goblin Tribal, Pump Spell Tribal. Now you see Zada Zero Drop, uh, I'm air quoting Tribal, Zero Drop, Draw Card, Storm Your Opponent Out Tribal, right? It's transformed from what it used to be into this very ubiquitous, very... Uh, Zada effect is what we call it on Commander yeah. Cookout, where there are only so many spells in mono red that say draw a card and target creature right mm -hmm. and if i could throw a little shade i would maybe want to change that from the zada effect to the feather the redeemed effect throwing that out there joey can't like hearing that i i'm 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 feeling a little put Put in the spotlight a little bit. Okay, I guess there are so only so many instances that, you know, will work for Feather, I suppose. It kind of feels sort of similar. But then again, when Feather came out, Matt, Dana, and I each had sort of a... um 
a commander, uh, not quite a cook-off, but since you guys are on the show, that's what I'll call it, um, <laughs> where we each came up with a different feather uh, build where Dana, for example, built a feather blink deck. And then I went more of a storm strategy with stuff like Aetherflux Reservoir and stuff like that. So we still did find a, a bit of diversity there as opposed to something like Zada, where it feels like the field has actually shrunk a lot more um, over time, where it was like maybe some goblin stuff. And now it's more just into those those tiny things where you observe that Zada effect. So I'm I'm trying in vain to defend one of my favorite commanders. Hit him with the, what's going hit him on. With the truth. Truth, Brando. Did all three of those decks involve instants that targeted Feather and then ricocheted back to your hand? <laughs> uh, in lieu of responding to that, how about we shift our focus to talking <laughs> about one of Dana's commanders? Uh, because actually, this is kind of fun. Uh, when we were looking at this list, remember how I mentioned that we cut out any commanders that don't have enough decks to actually appear? We were only looking at that 100 deck threshold. That means that we actually cut the commander Jeru with eyes open because he did not have a whole lot of commander decks to his name at all. And he was within the top 10. So Dana, I thought you were all about that hipster life, but you've got a very, <laughs> very milky commander. Well, What's I mean, going it, on? It's very linear in, in that there's only a few mono white planeswalkers you can run in a super friends deck, but how many Jero decks were there total? Like six? <laughs> this is not a lot. <laughs> and, and given that I have the deck up on a couple of different deck builder sites that I've tested out, half of half those six are probably mine. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing 47 at the time that okay. we pulled the report. So. So, so, so 28 of them are mine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, but it's not actually just Jeru. If we looked a little bit farther down the list in the high 20s, we also had Reki, the history of Kamigawa, the mono green oh. legend fall sort of commander. Another one of your personal favorites. So Dana... There it is again. You keep building commanders that build themselves. I guess if they ever get popular, I'll have to take them apart. We, you know what? We call that the Dana Roach effect. <laughs> right. There yeah, it is. Yeah. There you go. Uh, but also, I mean, we had noticed among the top 10, there were a lot of trends such as uh, tribal and having specific keywords. You know, there were dwarves, vehicles, morphs, defenders, uh, stuff like that that we had looked through. Um, so what I actually also did when I was looking through this list, I wanted to expand that beyond just the top 10 and see maybe more among possibly the top uh, 50 or something like that to see if there were other commanders uh, here and try and find the top five that don't actually specifically name a tribe and that don't name a specific keyword such as more for madness or what have you. Um, and I came up with some pretty interesting results here. So obviously we have the Kozileks. I'm going to count them just as uh, just as one uh, because we do have them here. They don't specifically name Eldrazi in any of their abilities, but then again, when you build a colorless deck, you're probably going to have some number of them in there. So hence the high uh, homogeneity among those decks. Um, at number two on this particular metric, we do have Zada again. Zada doesn't specifically name a creature type or a mechanic. Number three, when we're looking beyond uh, tribes and mechanics, was Doretti Scrap Savant, the mono-red planeswalker who involves a lot of artifacts coming in and out of the graveyard. And that was actually at the total number uh, 33 on this list when we were looking at it. So I guess there's only so many cards that uh, work with the graveyard. So the deck kind of does streamline itself a little bit there, given the limited access. Again, the color restriction probably has a lot to do with that. At the number 40 slot in the number four position, according to this particular metric, Selenia, the Dark Angel, who pays a bunch of life, a really weird life swap type of deck where you lower your own life total and then give it away to other people using cards like uh, Reverse the Sands, or you weaponize your low life total with cards like Repay in Kind, which will lower everyone else's life total to your own low life total. So it makes sense that there's a lot of homogeneity among that particular strategy as well, because because there are only so many cards that do that particular thing, even if there isn't a named mechanic for that. And then the final one that I want to touch on here, number five on this no tribes or mechanics metric that I'm looking at, it was in the number 41 position. That's Phage the Untouchable, the mono black <laughs> commander that kills you if you play it. And again, that has to go to, there are only so many cards that can actually put Phage into your hand from the command zone or allow you to play it safely. Cards like Command Beacon or Torpor Orb, which will get around Phage's downside. So I guess it makes sense too that that would also be showing a lot of uh, similarity among the Phage lists because they need those cards for the deck to even work in the first place. It just sort of hit me while you were talking there actually, Doretti being on the list, because I mean, he's an artifacts commander, but let's just all be really clear about what Doretti actually is. He's a stacks commander. And when you play him, you're playing like things that say orb on them in tribal, probably. And that's probably why he ends up on this list, because he's a dirt sandwich to play against, because he's probably a stacks deck. 
He's probably mind slavering you is, is what happens. Yeah. yeah. I've run into mind slavers. I haven't run into stacks Doretti. I feel like you're around some cutthroat people there, yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not everybody's as nice as us. Yeah. We're, we, uh, there's some scumbags around here too. Maybe one of us plays stacks. We, we just no way to tell. <laughs> I'm looking at Doretti's page right now. Winter Orb shows up at 22% of decks. So I'm not sure that that's the entire solution, but I do think that you need to find some new people to play against because <laughs> it sounds like they're making you miserable when you go up against their Doretti lists. <laughs> hey, and can I just set the record straight real quick here? I don't know why. I don't know why I get the reputation of being the dirty, rotten Canadian scumbag. <laughs> you know what? There's a whole ton of content creators from Canada and Brando and he plays stacks <laughs> and he plays chaos and he's like, oh yeah, it's fun. I just play stacks. I don't even know what I'm doing. And then you just like crush everybody with like wrath of God after you turn all their lands into creatures. It's Ooh. not wrath of God. It's massacre worm. There's a difference, Ryan. <laughs> well, there is it. Ryan, you, you asked that question and you mentioned other Canadian content creators. You probably should ask the commander's brew guys, commander's brew guys, why they would think you would be a scumbag. Because I believe you backstabbed one of them in a tournament in Vegas just a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. International right. waters will do that to you. Hey? Yeah, I guess, huh? The funny, the best part of that story. He told me to I do it. I told him to do it. He told me. I showed him the cards. I'm like, do I do this? He's like, he almost smacked me. He was just like, yeah. yes. I've never been that close to striking another human being in public in my life. Oh my goodness, y'all are crazy. <laughs> the folks from CCO, ladies and gents. <laughs> uh, before we move on to the next part of our show, because we do want to talk about not just the low variance commanders, we want to talk about the high variance commanders, the spicy commanders. But before we get there, we've got a segment that we have to do, especially while we've got you guys on. That is challenge the stats. There's a lot of data here on EDH rec, but we don't always agree with it. Sometimes we think that cards are seeing too much play. Sometimes we think the cards are seeing too little play. So we like to challenge those statistics here. Matt, do you mind starting us off with Challenge the Stats? I sure can. So this week, I have another pick from my Alila deck that I've been playing around with. So I bought the Precon and played a couple games with it for, to build my Alila Artful Provocateur deck. That's the new uh, Throne of Eldraine Esper Fairy Commander that rewards you for casting artifacts and enchantments, and you, you make an army of, of fairies. The card I'm challenging in there, though, is still showing up in over 29% of Alila decks, and that is Shimmer Dragon. That is four blue blue for a 5-6 dragon with flying. As long as you control four or more artifacts, Shimmer Dragon has Hexproof, and then you can tap two untapped artifacts you control to draw a card. Now, we have talked a lot and to great lengths about all the different payoff cards in these types of decks, whether it's Psy Master Thopterist or any of those types of variants, Padim Console of, of Innovation, etc. There's, there's a whole slew of mono blue payoff cards for casting artifacts. I don't think this one at six mana is quite where you want to be with the deck. Six mana is a lot, especially in, in non-green, and a lot of what the deck wants to do is to be ramping. You want to be ca getting a lot of cast triggers and then using that, you know, say you're playing a bunch of Signets and Mana Rocks, which means you don't have a lot of untapped artifacts to be laying around to be tapping to the Dragon, which already is six mana. I think you want your payoff cards to be a little more cheap on the mana side and just a little more efficient with what they're doing. I think a Psy Master Thopterist, if you're going for a lot of artifacts on the battlefield, is probably a better strategy overall. Plus, Alila, you see a lot of different decks that are doing enchantment themes or flying themes. So... Seeing it in 29% of decks, if you're doing a very, very devoted artifact strategy for Shimmer Dragon, I think that's fine. But with seeing a lot of the builds that people are putting on EDH rec, I don't think the typical Alila deck, especially almost 30% of decks, wants to be playing Shimmer Dragon. It's just too expensive, I think, and it's a little win more. It also requires you to have a lot of artifacts on the board to really be effective. Yeah, it definitely seems like a Brawl precon effect happening for yes. the... EDH deck of Alila. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Since you had talked a bit about mana, I'll jump in with mine because the challenge that I have for this week is an underplayed card for Nikia of the Old Ways, who came out in the most recent Ravnica block and doubles your mana. Five mana, five, five Centaur Druid that doubles your lands. Whenever you tap a land for mana, you get an additional mana of that same type, but you cannot cast non-creature spells. There are nearly 700 Nikia of the Old Ways decks on here, and they contain so many creatures. So... Since you can't play non-creature spells, the goal for Nikia is to find clever ways to get 
spell-ish abilities on your creatures so that she can still access really cool effects even when she is restricted on certain types. And a particular creature that I want to call out for Nikia is Captivating Crew. This is a 4-mana human pirate. It is a 4-3 that has the uh, activated ability of paying 3 and a red to gain control of target creature and opponent controls until end of turn, untapping it and giving it haste. You can only activate that ability at any time you could cast a sorcery, but it is an amazing piece for Nikia because Captivating Crew basically only costs you two lands with Nikia because she's giving you some extra mana. And that activated ability also only costs you two lands. The normal restriction on Captivating Crew is that it costs a lot of mana to get this ability, but that is exactly what Nikia gives you. So Captivating Crew gives you an awesome way to steal creatures from other people for not too much actual investment and then use them to smash face with all of Nikia's amazing big creatures. It only shows up in 61 Nikia decks total, which I think is far, far too low for a really cool spell-ish effect that this commander could be taking advantage of. Well... I'm up next here, Joey, and I have uh, a Matt Morgan special here. I'm going to talk about a card that's been revealed. It's been out for uh, like 18 to 20 hours. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And and that's Athreos Shroud Veiled, who's the buy box promo from the New Theros set. And there is 100 Athreos decks out there. Um, The card in particular I'm challenging the stats on is Whip of Erebos, it's only in about a quarter of the Athreos decks. Um, the reason I'm challenging that, Whip of Erebos is a great card anyway. Like, even if you're not doing anything particularly abusive with it, four mana to give all your creatures lifelink at all times, not just attacking, is pretty good. And being able to bring a creature back from your graveyard to play just for the turn is also pretty useful too. Um, however, the way Athreos is designed, it's really the only way you can actually kind of abuse Whip of Erebos. The way Erebos, Whip of Erebos is written, the creature you bring back from the graveyard to play gets exiled at the beginning of the next end step, or if it would leave the battlefield, you exile it instead. There's really no way to cheat that, except for Athreos, who puts a, a coin counter on another creature. When that creature with a coin counter on it is put into exile or dies, you bring it back into play under your control. So it's actually the way you can cheat things with Erebos when you bring them back with the Whip of Erebos bring them back, put a coin counter on them. When they leave it in a turn, it just comes back into play again. That's brilliant. It, I... it, it's a great card in the you know worst of circumstances, and in Athreos, it's disgusting. Yeah, I'm I'm here for it, man. Every every day that we, that Athreos is around, I'm like, maybe do I build this one? <laughs> it's just another version of almost necromancy. So of course it appeals to me, man. I really like it. this. Is a really really cool commander. Uh, let's move on to the CCO guys now. What are your challenges? What you got? Brando, hit him with the truth again. All right, boys. This is a card that I think is just, it is sorely underplayed in Magic in general. Um, it's only in 2% of all decks, and it could go in all of those decks. And in, I think... In, it, including, who's in the flavor text? Jiru. Okay. So it could be a flavor win for somebody here at the table. And the card, gentlemen, is Manolith. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you monster. This, it taps, it's it's for three, it taps for any color, there's no other, like, texts or abilities. No drawbacks? Or, no drawbacks. There's no bullcrap you have to mess around with. It's three mana, to get one mana of any color, it goes in every deck, and nobody's playing it. And I think that people should be. Super hipster. No yeah. Tim Hortons Just like for Dana. You. <laughs> no, no. This is easily the worst of the three mana mana rocks, and we know that you're trolling us. Do you have an actual pick, or is your pick to say that mana lip is actually overplayed? I actually do have a, a real pick. And I mean, this is a contentious one between me and Ryan even. Uh, my pick is, again, it's in all decks. It's in like 15% of all decks on EDHREC.com. And it's Harmonize. It's a green, green, two, draw three cards. And every time I see that card played or I see it in a list or somebody on turn four or five plays Harmonize, it feels to me like when they were building that deck, they went into their binder or their box or the store or whatever. And they're like, eh, whatever. And it's like a throwaway card to me. It doesn't make the card bad. I'm not saying that nobody should play it. But I think that if you're going to try and go for variance and go for spice and make an exciting deck, I think that you should just play something that's fun there as opposed to something that's going to draw you to the one other fun thing that you're playing. So 
this was something that actually came up on the episode that you guys reviewed my deck, uh, my Virtus and Gorm deck on your show. Um, you criticized my choice of running Harmonize in that deck, and you said that I should play sure other did. cards like Rishkar's Expertise or in uh, the the Garrick, I can't remember what it's called, some Throne of Eldraine, Return of the Wildspeaker, I think it is. Um, and you were like, why aren't you playing these? And the reason is because I have a one power commander and a two power commander in that deck. So mm. playing a Rishkar's Expertise <laughs> draws me like one card on average and a harmonize is just a better way of getting more card advantage in that particular list so don't be too harsh on us harmonizers it it actually <laughs> is kind of nice when we just need a quick no stress isn't related to the power of my creature's way to get back into the game a little bit and, and that's fine and i'm never gonna like actually criticize somebody for playing it it just feels like a kind of meh in most situations to me. Every card has their place. Even Manolith probably no. has a place somewhere. <laughs> Not here, but somewhere. And I think Harmonize is the same way, but I think it is overplayed, and I think that in most situations, you could probably just play anything else. I will give you... my. I consider my Virtus and Gorm list to be one of my... Uh my spicier feeling decks, but I will grant you that Harmonize does feel like the most vanilla ingredient in that particular recipe. It's like the odd man out. It's like there's a 99, like, yeah, this is great, and then Harmonize. <laughs> I, I, I still totally love the card, so we've got a challenge on the challenge, but I can see the, the emotions that you've got attached to it. Uh, so, Ryan, I guess now it means that we're moving on to yours. Yeah, my challenge the stats today is another green four mana sorcery in explosive vegetation. Dana's other favorite card. It's in twenty percent of decks. I'm guys. guessing you're gonna think this is also underplayed. No, I'm just <laughs> trolling you again. <laughs> <laughs> no, my actual challenge the stats today comes by way of my girl, Zada. When I look at the mana bases of some of the Zada decks, I don't see very often three cards those cards sandstone needle dwarven ruins and ancient tomb and those are all lands that see play at an eight percent clip in the 733 zada decks on edhrec.com and they all give you two mana and combo players know that you need mana most combos are mana hungry there's great ways to draw cards in zada and blue base combos and green base combos and black base combos sorry white but we can draw lots of cards we have access to all the pieces but we always need more mana and usually it's just that one extra that one short that caused us to lose the game because you had to wait for another go around of the of the table right to to drop the next land in our hand and ancient tomb you can tap it for two cool but it is expensive so i can see why people might not play it but dwarven ruins and sandstone needles commons 10 cent cards and and available in all different colors there are a cycle of common lands like sandstone needles the depletion lands from mercadian masks you can get them in every color so you can combo in any color and of course dwarven ruins originally in fallen empires and then reprinted in sixth edition i believe Whoa. so you can get them in either set and beat down i think the box set beat down <laughs> from 98 i don't know if anybody's as old as brando and i and dana <laughs> That's such an interesting pick. I mean, these particular lands, they are not built for longevity, and we usually associate EDH games with, you know, longevity, a game of endurance, basically. And a, a land like Sandstone Needle actually depletes and then will eventually, you know, go away. But the point that you point out for a Zada deck is very much combo oriented. So it actually does make a bit more sense to go for the initial thing. That's a very red mentality. Sometimes you do just need that one extra mana, though we do ask that it not be produced by a manolith. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Hey, get this. Crystal Vein, too. I just yeah. looked up Crystal Vein. 4% really of Zada decks play Crystal Vein. You sacrifice that for two, two colorless, yep. just like Dwarven Ruins. Very it's interesting. I play. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Building your mana base around the particular strategy that you're doing, including if it's a combo, uh, you know, the one big burst of flame. I really like that. That's really clever. It's a good observation and a good thing to know about your deck for sure. All right, guys. Are you ready to get on to the spicy list hell yeah let's do it so now we are going to get to the top 10 commanders with the least amount of 
uh, homogeneity. These are the high variants. If you sit across from one of these particular commanders, it might look completely different than if you sit across from it on a different day against a different player. These decks do not tend to have a whole lot in common. So Matt, start us off. What is our most high variance commander? So number one, the spiciest pepper out there, the biggest average deck variance is going to be Chromat. That is the five color commander from Apocalypse. It has five different activated abilities, one for each enemy color pairing. And it, we have 174 decks out there with Chromat to it. Only 28% of cards overlap between all of those decks. And number two here, we have Progenitus, the um, giant Hydra avatar from Alara, I believe. Um, five, another five color deck. There's 446 of these though and it's at 31% ubiquity. Up next in the number three position is Zira Arian. This is a Jund insect lady question mark thing. Uh, it is a three mana one, two with flying that you can pay a black, red, green and tap it to have target player draw a card. Surprisingly, we have 104 of these decks and they have a ubiquity score of 36%. I think your boys at CCO might have built that one. Yeah, we did. <laughs> that is a terrible card. <laughs> yeah. uh, so coming in next, number four, we have Corona the False God, another five-color commander. Uh, it's a weird one. It has haste, and it basically goes around the table. Everybody gets a chance to attack with Corona False God. It's a really weird commander. 376 decks, though, to it. 38% ubiquity score on there. And up next, number five, Thraxa Mundar. The um, uh, it will be a zombie assassin, I believe, that was in the OR block. Three colors, 242 decks, and it's at 40% ubiquity. Up next, Dana, I'm sure you'll be very excited to hear that yeah. in the sixth position, we've got Vela the Nightclad. Six mana, four, four human wizard with intimidate that gives your other creatures intimidate. And whenever she or another creature you control leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses one life. We've got 194 Vela the Nightclad decks at the time that we ran this report, and they also had 40% ubiquity. So Dana, you had some, uh, some milky commanders, but it looks like you've got a spicy commander here too that is showing up in the top 10. I have reclaimed my spice crown. <laughs> <laughs> so the number seven spiciest one, we're cooling down a little bit. It's not super hot, but Teneb the Harvester, the Abzan dragon, legendary dragon. Uh, it's a weird kind of reanimator type of dragon. Uh, 195 decks though, 40% overlap among all of the decks. And number eight, we have Janara, Asura of War, three color uh, angel commander out of Alara again. 223 decks at 40% ubiquity. And this is actually a commander I just built for my wife. Ooh. Oh, very nice. Well, you've got a spicy inclusion among the list yeah. for both of you guys then. Awesome. In the number nine position, we've got Ramos, Dragon Engine, a six mana artifact dragon. It's a four, four with flying. And whenever you cast a spell, it gets bigger equal to the number of colors that that spell was. And you can remove five counters from Ramos to make two mana of each color, though you can only activate that ability once per turn. Really, really crazy one there. We've got over 1300 Ramos decks and they had 41% ubiquity among them. And coming in at number 10, the last one, two in a row of colorless creatures, but five color commanders, however that's supposed to work. But we have Golos Tireless Pilgrim. He's five mana for a legendary scout. Comes in the battlefield, you can search your library for a land to put it into play, and then you can pay chromatic colors plus two generic and exile the top three cards of your library and cast any of them for free. There are 1,680 decks out there, 42% overlap on that one. So... Back to you guys at CCO. What do you make of the spicy commanders? What trends do you notice here? Well, I mean, I, I assume everybody picked up on this as well. There's a lot of five color here. And I think that the reason there's a lot of five color here is because, I mean, some people just don't want to be constrained to anything. So they pick a commander that just sort of maybe works. It has abilities that might be relevant. It could be okay. That's like, I bet you... This time next year, Morphon's going to be on that list probably, and so is Kenrith, because they're just five-color good stuff commanders that you can do actually anything with. There's no reason not to play them if you're playing five-color, and you're not going to with dragons or slivers or elementals. They're just good cards that give you access to 
all of the good cards. Yeah, they're very open-ended, right? And even when you go outside of just the five-color ones, when you look at Thraxamundar, he's a zombie, but he's giving you access to the traditional main three zombie colors. Teneb, he's reanimator, but he gives you access to whatever you want to reanimate across three different colors, not just a certain tribe or just one color or two colors. In all the best reanimation colors, too. You had mentioned Kenrith and Morophon. I think it will not surprise you that Kenrith was number 15, according to the list, and Morophon was number 18. Because again, <laughs> five color, very, very <laughs> open-ended. These are very much the opposite of the observation that we made among the Milky list. These are commanders that don't tell you what to do at all. You have to actually bring the deck to them as opposed to them bringing a deck's idea to you. Yeah, you like bring them in and you tell them what to do. It's like, you listen to me, Kenrith. You sit over there and you draw me a card. That's very aggressive. You draw me a card and you shut up. And that's, that's very aggressive. basically how the wow. deck goes. Well, it's just funny. We talk about some commanders being diverse. Uh, Atraxa, for instance, can do so many things, but she's actually around like number 150 on the spicy list out of the list of 600. Uh, but she does at least give you some direction. And I think that's a really important distinction to make here. So many of the commanders that we just discussed here have almost no direction whatsoever. They're just kind of blank slates for instance and we actually can kind of also see that with some of the other commanders that we look at here uh stuff like anafenza and samut though they are three color they also have basically infinity directions to go because they don't ask of a specific type of deck they're not saying specifically combo specifically voltron uh specifically tokens or anything like that you have a lot of different areas that you can go um and since we were also talking about you know, five color being very prominent on here. I went through the list to find the first mono color deck that shows up on the spicy, since, you know, color restriction might have something to do with how spicy a commander is. Sadisi Undead Vizier was the spiciest mono color commander that I could find. And it was at number 40 on the spice list. And that's the one that can be a tutor. And interestingly, the next most spicy quote unquote commander that is on the list is at the number 80 slot and that's Marilyn of the Mornsong. Again, a monoblock commander <laughs> and again, one that tutors. The Kinda least weird. spicy thing you can possibly do. Well, and you know what? It's funny. I'm, I'm going to try and take this one. With, I think both of them have such a range that you can build, right? You can build mono black zombies mono black find whatever way i want to win find my big mana package find my whatever in either of those decks and interestingly enough both of those commanders have fairly degenerate cedh builds based around them as well so you could play you know janky common zombie tribal sadisi or you could play like sadisi razaketh buried alive combo there's or, a range well, in power level and a range in, in um, I guess, scaling. Is that the word? Ubiquity, competitiveness. Well, they, they both also have a kind of a real janky combo deck where you use their tutor ability to go get ad nauseum. And yes. your deck has like 95 swamps in it. And you just draw every single swamp and eventually hit a, a card called Dark Sphere that you can play for zero mana. And it, it, reduces the um, source of the damage to be dealt to by the next source by half. And then you cast a card called Sickening Dreams, where every card you discard deals damage to all players. So you just then dump all those swamps to dome everybody for, you know, 40 or whatever it is and win the game. Wow. Listeners out there, it works with Glacial Chasm yeah. as well. And, and it's like a, it's like a, you know, $15 <laughs> deck. Dang, that is really weird and complicated, and I'm not entirely sure that I follow, but you said <laughs> discarding lands, and that's a thing that I've done before, because I play a lot of death and a lot of land death, <laughs> so I think I could be into it, it it's a It's a cool deck that's hilarious, and it's worth the $15 to surprise people the <laughs> one time it works. <laughs> Fair enough. It's worth the $15 you'll spend on ad nauseum to right, play yeah, it one time. Because that's the only card that's worth it. anything, really. So a, a fun thing that I kind of want to point out here, just like when we were going through this top 10 list and we were talking about stuff like Corona, we were talking about Progenitus, we we're talking about uh, Ramos or Golos. I mean, I got to admit, when we were reading through these, these kind of struck me as commanders that I don't personally want to build. Ironically, the commanders with the highest variance also seem to be the ones that people sometimes accuse of being quote unquote good stuff. And that's usually something that we associate with I don't know, it's kind of a negative term to say good stuff as though it's not original necessarily. And yet these commanders are definitionally more original when you compare them against each other because they have 
less in common with each other when they're helmed by the same commander. So that is just kind of a, an interesting point that I want to you know point out there and basically point out that if a commander is milky or it has low variance, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad and spicy doesn't mean good. You know, generally the commanders on the milk list had a lot more interest to me, a lot more intrigue than the ones here on the spice list. I am more likely to build one of those niche tribes or an Arcades defender or something like that, because that even though the deck builds itself, it does seem like a little bit more fun because it's niche to me. So that was a fun thing that I wanted to point out here. And I kind of wanted to get your guys take on it, too. I think that there's something to be said about like in in a, like a non magic context, if somebody gives you a box full of stuff. And you dump it on the table and you say, well, what can I do with this stuff? I think that that's a more fun kind of a brain puzzle to to go over than if somebody just puts you in a field and says, you can use anything you want here. Go do something. Because you're going to immediately kind of gravitate to what's the easiest, what's the strongest, what's the best. Whereas if you've got kind of a constraint, like your your deck has to include dwarves and vehicles. I'll go back to that one again. Like, how are you going to make that different than every other deck? And I think that therein lies the challenge. And I think that, that appeals to the the deck builder and all of us. Like, I want to take this and I'm going to put my spin on it and I'm going to make it different. Yeah, there's there's two things that I think of when I, when I look at these spicy commanders that don't give you a direction. And they, they go back to my roots in teaching and coaching. And one of them is paralysis by analysis. When you can, when you can analyze all of magic, all of gatherer, all of EDH rec. Well, what do I build? Right? What? I don't know what I want to do. How do I just make mana? And then Kenrith will just do everything, right? The other thing I think of is is a, a kind of a mantra that I've heard in the teaching and coaching realm is when you can do anything, the hardest part is doing anything, right? Because you don't have any structure, you don't have any as Brando says it restrictions but when I think of restrictions I think of structure I have to fit inside of this box I have to fit through this box right when you when you can do anything it's hard to do anything and then your deck just ends up being like 10 card draw spells 10 mana rocks 10 ramp spells five creatures that are going to win me the game and that's my deck throw in 35 mana I'm ready to go Here's one last bomb that I kind of want to drop on this conversation too. Um, a commander that I noticed on this list at number 35, spicy, very high variance for this one was Yidris Maelstrom Wielder, the Cascadia commander. There's a lot of variance among these lists. And I have actually built a Yidris deck and it played exactly the same way every single game. So I kind of want to just leave that particular impression on, you know, sort of a bow on this conversation too. You know, spice and milk and high variance and low variance don't necessarily mean good or bad commanders, but they also don't necessarily affect the level of variance in your gameplay either. If you've got spicy going on in the actual deck, I would almost wager that that's more important for it to be more variance and, you know, who knows what could happen. This is a lot of crazy stuff going on within the actual 99, even if the deck tends to look a lot like someone else's, because those high variance moments within gameplay keep a deck fresh and exciting for me to return to, um, you know, game after game after game. As opposed to 100%, a commander... 100%, right? Unique yeah. Yeah. gameplay experience is what we want when we play Commander, right? That's what right. we playing Legacy. So this is just one other thing to sort of keep in mind, what we call spicy and high variance and et cetera. There are actually a lot of different ways to measure it. And we looked at the you know commanders and seeing what the 99 has in common with each other, but what they do in gameplay also matters a whole lot more. So there's a lot of interesting data here and it was a whole lot of fun to go over with you guys. But I have one final question for you. Do you think that you can predict what your spiciest or least spicy commanders are? Because y'all sent me a list of your commanders and I looked up the answers. Oh no. So oh, we, no. we already oh, went I don't know. We already went over Dana's. We saw that Jeru was technically his milkiest commander, has a lot in common <laughs> with the other Jeru decks. And Vela was actually in the top ten spicy. So we already knows uh we already know Dana's. He's basically a zero star rating and a five star spice rating at the same time somehow. <laughs> so well done, Dana. Uh Matt, Thank you. your milkiest commander was Tesa Karlov at get okay. this number 167 so not okay. all that milky actually and your spiciest is miri 
Weatherlight Duelist at number 132. That's very middle of the road. You're pretty average at the three stars, I would say. I was actually uh. going to guess because I knew Miri had... She, Miri suffers a lot from the pre-con effect. If you look at the average deck, there's a bunch of cats because it came in the cat pre-con. So I was going to guess mm -hmm. that was probably going to be one of the milkiest ones. So that's actually very encouraging to hear. Very much. Uh, for me, my milkiest commander, least amount of variants, was Titania at number 50 on the milk list. Titania has a lot in common with other Titania decks, but my spiciest was Mimeoplasm at 66 level uh, there. So I felt pretty good about that. Mimeoplasm still has a lot of originality stuffed in there, which is cool. And now on to Ryan and Brando. Ryan, Ooh. we already know that you have Zada at number 12 on the milk toast <laughs> level. Yeah, uh, I blew you guys out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> But then you also have Child of Alara deck, and that is the number 14 spiciest uh, commander. So you're actually really up there, too, also on that one star versus five stars rating. Because you've got that was going to be my guess Child of Alara. Because it's a, a five color commander that doesn't have a specific direction. Exactly. So now yeah. on to Brando. I'm sure that you'll be happy to know that your Norin the Wary deck is number 109. So actually a pretty decent amount of right. uh, spice, even among your milkiest commander. Um, oh, and then awesome. your spiciest commander is actually, bizarrely, in a weird twist that kind of breaks apart all of the stuff that we were talking about early in this episode, your highest variance commander is Sliver Queen at number 46. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid slivers. I have to assume that this is because Sliver Queen is like the least Sliver tribal of the Sliver five color commanders, right? Like some I people tell actually everybody, play this combo. she's a combo deck. She's a combo deck, people. She's not a Sliver deck. It yeah. is. A lot of weird stuff going on there indeed. So this was a ton of fun. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Where can folks find you and all of the content over at CCO? Uh, well, you can find us at CCO Podcast and CCO Brando on Twitter and tappedout.net. That's where you can see the deck list that we've talked about and any other list that we're going to do on the show later on. You can also find us at CCO Podcast anywhere better social media and your podcasts are found. And if you want a full list of all the places you can get in touch with us and interact with the show, you can check out our full list of that on Commander Cookout. Uh, dot com. <laughs> awesome stuff. I'd also like to thank my co-host so much for joining me. And if our listeners would like to get in touch with us, where can they find you all? Matt? You can find me on the Twitters and also the Twitch at Mathemus55. That's M-A-T-H-I-M-U-S-5-5. And Dana. You can find me on Twitter at Dana Roach, and you can hear me on my other podcast once or twice a week at CMDR Central. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me at Joseph M. Schultz on Twitter. You can find the cast at EDH Recast on Facebook or on Twitter. And if you have a question, a keen insight to EDH Rec's data, or maybe a challenge to stats pick that you think that we should know about, you can contact us at EDHRecast at gmail.com. Listeners, we would love to hear from you about which of your decks you think is the spiciest or has the least in common with other decks that use those same commanders. Do you prefer niche strategies or the open-ended high variance commanders? We would love to hear from you. Don't forget to follow the cast on Facebook, Twitter, subscribe on YouTube, and and leave us a review to be entered into our episode 100 giveaway, which we are announcing in one week. You have just one more week to follow the cast and leave us a review, so make sure you do to have a chance to win that giveaway. We will be back at you next week with more data and insights, but until then, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. A third person's nice if, because on Commander Central, I'll say this, if someone's having an off day with two people, it's tough for one person to cover for them. Whereas with three, it's much easier to have two people still be good. You guys should know all about that because you got Max Crandell, and that's just a handicap from the get go, right? <laughs> Dunking on Max Crandell, he's not even going to hear it. Uh, he might. I might use that as the stinger for this show. <laughs>